Uh, so we're all here today to talk about J. Robert Oppenheimer. The idea of J. Robert Oppenheimer has always been captivating to a broad audience. Many of us, including our moderators and panelists, are very excited to see Christopher Nolan's interpretation of this much told story this July. The myth of Oppenheimer was being shaped, shaped and reshaped before the dust of Trinity test had even settled. But what are we more fascinated by, the man or the history he lets us tell about ourselves? Today, the archives and the Math and Natural Science Library of the Institute for Advanced Study is very excited to bring together four science writers to help us explore this very question. I'm going to introduce our first panelist, Shabon Roberts is a science journalist and a regular contributor to the New York Times. She is the author most recently of Genius at Play, The Curious Mind of John Horton Conway, which she wrote during various visits at the, as a director's visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study. She is currently working on a biography of another Institute mathematician, Verena Hubert Dyson, uh, who was a member here from 1948 to 1949. Uh, our next panelist, uh, Graham Farmelow, is an award-winning biographer and science writer uh, based in London. Graham is a fellow at Churchill College, Cambridge, Cambridge University, and a regular visitor at IAS. His books include The Strangest Man, The Hidden, Li Hidden Life of Paul Dirac, Quantum Genius, Churchill's Bomb, How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arms Race, and most recently, The Universe Speaks in Numbers, How Modern Math Reveals Nature's Deep Deepest Secrets. Our next speaker is George Dyson. George is a science historian as well as a boat designer and builder. He's the author of Bidarka, Project Orion, The Atomic Space Shift, 1957 to 1965, Darwin Among the Machines, Turing's Cathedral, and most recently, Analogia, The Entangled Destinies of Nature, Human Beings, and Machines. And last but certainly not least, we have Alex Wellerstein. Alex is a historian of science and technology with a research specialty in the history of nuclear weapons. He's the author of Restricted Data, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States, released by University of Chicago Press in 2021. And he's also the creator of the Restricted Data blog and the Nuke Map, a popular website for simulating the effects of nuclear weapons. Alex's writings for general audiences have been featured in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and many other venues. He has a PhD from the Department of the History of Science at Harvard University, was a research fellow at the Managing the Atom and International Security Programs at the Harvard Kennedy School, and an associate historian at the American Institute of Physics. Presently, Alex is an associate professor uh, and the director of the of science and technology studies at the Stevens Institute of Technology Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. So, welcome to all of our panelists. And before we get started, we are going to leave uh, time at the end of our moderated questions for some audience questions from you. Please submit them through the Zoom Q and A function, and we'll receive them. And please feel free to leave commentary in the chat, but be respectful of the panelists and your fellow attendees. And with that, Caitlin, take it away. Well, thank you to our panelists for being here today. I'm going to get us started with our first question. What do you feel can be learned by revisiting Oppenheimer's legacy in the public sphere today? For the members of our audience who, like us, are just planning to see this movie on the 21st when it comes out, what should they remember? And Alex, if you don't mind, we'd like to start with you. Yeah, thanks so much. And I'm so pleased to be on this panel and to be here. You know, when as a historian who has studied Oppenheimer quite a bit, I'm interested in the fact that we like to tell the story of Oppenheimer and we always tell it. It, it sort of serves as a parable whenever we're telling it. And it's either a parable about what theoretical science can get you, or it's a parable about the evils of politics, or it's the parable of it's a Faust story. And so the thing that I would have people think about when they're watching it is like what is the message of this movie like what is this parable supposed to be what does nolan think the parable is and then like why does that work or not work right if the movie is a big hit and everybody says this is the oppenheimer what does that say about us in our moment that like this is the version we want to tell whereas if it's a huge flop and people say <laughs> this doesn't make any sense i'm not saying i don't know what it will be uh like that would be, that's interesting nonetheless too like where does it diverge so anyway those are the things that come to my mind um i'm interested in what other people have to say as well <laughs> 
So uh, Graham, Siobhan, George, feel free to jump in. Okay, I'll, I'll just say it's it's interesting we're sort of here reviewing a film that none of us have seen. I just bought a ticket. It opens in Bellingham on the 20th. So I'll see the first showing. And also all I've seen is the trailers and the thing that struck me most is they had no concept of New Jersey in the 1940s because all the cars were completely clean in front of Fault Hall. And in Princeton in the 1940s, cars are either dusty or muddy. There's no, uh, <laughs> so we'll go from there. But the, the, to me, the story, you see it on so many levels, but it, that, you know, Los Alamos was paradise for scientists, but, but every paradise comes with a catch. And the catch was that there was a bargain. And the bargain was that uh, we, the, the military, are not going to tell you, the scientists, how to do science. And so you can do science however you want, and we'll give you all the funding in the world. And it was absolute, it was everybody had the happiest times of their lives. But the catch was you, the scientists, can't, don't tell the military how to use the weapons. And the tragedy, the, the Oppenheimer story is Oppenheimer broke that bargain. And to me, that's the story. So, Yeah, for, uh, for my part, uh, I, shall be, I shall be very interested to see uh, how uh, Nolan uh, and his, his uh, actors present uh, Oppenheimer, because it's, it's, it's almost a cliche to say that, uh, that Oppenheimer was an enigma. Uh, actually, it's a cliche, but it's probably true. It's, he has so there's so many different aspects to his character, so many different ways of reading him. Uh, and I'd also say, I mean, I've been through his archive at the Library of Congress and his great papers here at the, the Institute and references elsewhere. It's very, very difficult to, to see a sharp image of somebody there. There's obviously greatness in there. There's in, uh, there's enormous talent. There's so many qualities, but I would find I find it very difficult to picture him. Uh, so that, that's why I like to see these, uh, these uh, there are a small number of interviews that are available online. Anyway, it'd be fascinating to see if, where, uh, where the movie plumps, you know, for, uh, for their take on, uh, on this figure. It was interesting for me, I was actually here last summer when, when they were shooting and the, the campus was sort of um, reverted back to the, the 1950s and, you know, the common room was um, looking much more old fashioned and all the nameplates on the doors were changed and um, you know you saw Cillian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. Robert Downey Jr. tromping around but um, really have very little sense of, of what is in store. It, they did not give much away um, but for me I just think it's an interesting time to have this um, historical chapter brought to the fore especially with what we're contemplating with AI and, and, and those parallels that are being drawn between AI and the atomic age. So uh, that uh, is actually a great segue into our next question. Um, uh, how, did, how do you think the atomic age and the era of Oppenheimer, the era of Einstein sets the stage for how we, the general public, and I think Caitlin and I include ourselves in the general public here, uh, engage with science, um, and how can how has the era of Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project therefore echoed into your own life's work? Um, and I think uh, George has an especially interesting perspective on this. So we'll start with George. Good. Yeah, that's that's two questions. The first, <laughs> the first part, I th just to take one angle, I think that I mean this Manhattan Project reinforce for better or worse the equation of science with technology we just everything is science and technology we assume that you can't have science without technology which is what happened at los alamos and we then assume that you can't have technology without science but it's actually quite possible to have science without technology or technology without science and and technology without science is a risk that we are running into that we may end up having all the technology but losing our sort of real ability to do science and that that to me is a danger and we should think more about that not just assume the two go together forever and then personally the manhattan project i mean it led you know uh 
my father was not there, but all his sort of friends were. Um, and the Manhattan Project led directly to two other projects, the Project Orion, the space project, which was Stan Huam's idea, and uh, the Electronic Computer Project here at IAS. And so, and both those two projects became sort of major uh, subjects of my own life. I wrote, you know, and and I was wrapped up in that for, you know, since childhood for 50 years. So mm -hmm. sort of the, the echo of the Manhattan Project is still there. And it's still, it is that, that lost paradise that everyone in science wants to get back to. Why can't we, you know, have another Manhattan Project and solve mm -hmm. some of these problems? Alex, Graham, Siobhan? I'll, I'll just say that I'm a historian of science and the even the idea that you would study the history of science uh, in a serious way comes out of this period. And it's exactly for those reasons that George mentions that the Manhattan Project in World War II become, it becomes clear to people, not only is it a model of science and technology, it's a model of like how science and technology lead to uh, dominance or victory or or, or loss if you do it wrong. And so uh, uh, there was some study of the history of science around World War I, uh, but it's after World War II, James Conant, who was on the Manhattan, Pro one of the administrators of the Manhattan Project, was the president of Harvard. He uh, essentially accelerated the study of history of science and the education in the history of science on the argument that if people did not understand how science and technology worked, they were going to be in for a real problem uh, down the line. And this led to, among other things, Thomas Kuhn. I mean, he came out of that. He was working with Conant and all that. So anyway, I, I, I just want to be even more meta here. It's like not just how we understand science. It, it, it's like one of the reasons there were preconditions for this already in the early 20th century, but World War II and especially the atomic bomb, it becomes the reason for why you should be obsessed with science in the first place for a lot of people outside of, you know, people who are just naturally nerdy. Uh, but it becomes a sort of public justification for all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, I took a look at the um, some of the, the writing Oppenheimer did for the, the general public. Um, and Emma pointed me to the the last um, of the wreath lectures that Oppenheimer did, which are is available on on the BBC website. And he says a couple interesting things there, just in terms of um, which is interesting to reflect on, just in terms of you know the the public at large being aware of you know scientific um, discoveries and implications and. Um, it's interesting how he talks about community and and um, he's not just talking about the scientists, but bringing, um, you know, everybody in society into really uh, exposure to have exposure with scientific ideas. And he says at one point, it's kind of humorous, he sort of says, um, you know, we are, of course, an ignorant lot. And then he sort of gives a, a chuckle, which was by far the the liveliest moment of the uh, the talk. Um, but then he says, you know, the mitigant of our ignorance is, is the possibility of knowledge and open access to knowledge and uh, the possibility of, you know, observing and analyzing and um, asking questions, how, why, and to what end, and sort of engaging everybody in society in that conversation. And so it was impressive to see how, how, how deeply he thought about um, how to convey uh, scientific ideas and engagement with science to the, the public at large. Graham? Yeah, I just have uh, one, one comment that uh, all my life I've been, just ever since I heard about the Manhattan Project, I've been fascinated by, by just its sheer size. I mean, you're be talking about a project that, that I gather comes in at $24 billion the, these days, a, a, a weapon delivered which many scientists thought was ba barely possible just before the outbreak of the war. And then it was delivered in uh, a working weapon delivered in three years. And I, I still don't think Oppenheimer actually gets enough credit, right, for the work he did on science in delivering the science and technology uh, of, of, that, uh, of, of that project. Remember, he was not the greatest scientist in that group. Right. But he 
he brought together these physicists, chemists, engineers, and a host of other people who had to work with the government. And he had to do all this stuff, that hand, making sure they had the right atmosphere there, that all, all the equipment, I know money was no object, but it, it, working with that many scientists is like herding, herding kangaroos, frankly. It's really, really not easy. And he did it. And you still get, I'm, I'm fascinated too, that just globally as a species, uh, how many times have we really got together to address the biggest problems? I mean, it used to be a kind of cliche, people talk about climate change, why don't we have a Manhattan Project for climate change? And I know that that lost traction when people say, well, we actually know what to do, it's just we don't have the willpower power to do it. But I'm just wondering, in, in the coming decades or centuries, optimistically of our species, whether we ever have, will have the wherewithal to, to, to maybe to do a global Manhattan Project to, uh, to address really, really big issues. And as I said, I think then we, we come across the challenge of finding people who really can lead scientists or technologists who can manage a project on that side. So for me, that, that, that's a, a mystery in itself, uh, because that was a truly remarkable achievement, in my opinion. I hope you don't mind, our panelists. I'm going to ask just a little bit of a, a follow-up question to that question. Uh, George, you talked about this distinction between science and technology, and because it came up and echoed in every response afterwards, I wonder if you could take a moment to talk and um, say directly what it is exactly that you see as the difference between science and technology in this context. Well, yes, I mean, you could sort of take an example. I mean, that, that you know, mathematics is a science, but you don't need technology. You can be shipwrecked on a beach and right in the sand and you could spend your life doing mathematics with no technology at all and in fact some of the best mathematics done at the institute was done in exactly that way just with chalk I and mean, it's you know it's, it's it's sand on slate and then on the other hand you can end up in a easily end up in a world where you, you know where we have technology but you no longer have the science which is the questioning things we can just say well okay um we have iphones that's all we need let's just stop and stop questioning everything after that point so so i think it's important to, to make that distinction that's that's of course uh you know something that that freeman dyson always said that that, that you just don't you know he found some of the best mathematics was was done in these Japanese temples with no uh, technology at all. Well, I believe uh, Abraham Flexner, uh, first director of the Institute, once said, once said that to set up a fine mathematics center, all you needed was chalk, uh, coffee, and a decent library. Although I have as the library, and I have to shout that out. <laughs> if I could just say one thing. Uh, if you look at the long history of science and technology, you find that the development, the people who are developing those two things in most cultures are not the same people, right? There's people who are kind of interested in natural knowledge about the world or systems of thinking about it. And there's people who are interested in sort of making things to, for whatever reason. And it's actually relatively recently, like the modern era, more or less, 19th century, where those things get so tightly bound that it becomes impossible to imagine them not going back and forth. And the technology mm -hmm. modifies what you can study, like a telescope, right? And then the telescope gives you ideas about some deep thing of nature, and now you're making a rocket ship that's powered by nuclear bombs or whatever, right? And uh, just to bring it back to Orion. But... Um, I think it's really interesting when I teach the history of science to undergraduates, they always assume that there's some sort of linear relationship, one direction or the other. And not only is there is it not linear, it goes all over the place, but historically, it's like it doesn't even exist. Like in some cultures, it's, it's just totally different social groups and norms responsible for either the mathematicians and the plumbers are not talking to each other and if that's how you're if, if that's how you're thinking of the science technology divide then like it, it almost makes sense that they're not talking to each other but anyway just pointing that out although the mathematicians are starting to talk to the computer scientists and use ai it's something i've spent a, a while thinking about recently and um it was interesting one of the mathematicians uh jordy williamson of sydney he collaborated with the deep mind um, and 
early on in the research, one of the neural nets, you know, produced a um, did a calculation and, and produced sort of an entity that that he was very you know deeply uh, interested in, but they couldn't understand how it had done it, and so they sort of probed a bit and tried to tried to figure out what the neural net had done because if if they could understand it, then they would have a theorem, um, but they couldn't, and so you know they moved on, and he sort of commented that you know, uh, in the tech business, that's, that's, that's fine. You know, it's the sort of hackiness culture. He said, you know, if it works, that's great. Um, but mathematicians really want to understand the why of it and, and get a, the sort of the more intuitive leaps that the machine is somehow taking. Well, speaking of the different roles involved in kind of the context, uh, our next question is, what are the responsibilities of science writers in representing the facts as evidenced in historical records, while also portraying the narrative of their subjects? And we were thinking particularly about the way that this, this movie and the trailers and what we've seen seems to be playing with the idea of a mythic or mysterious Oppenheimer. And we wanted to think about how Oppenheimer himself cultivated and resisted this, and then how science writers uh, have or do not have responsibilities to their subjects. And Siobhan, I think we'd like to get started with you. Yeah, I can speak to um, that that latter aspect, um, perhaps more than the, the myth, but um, it's an interesting question and it's, it's always uh, difficult to untangle the myth from reality. And in crafting a narrative, um, you have to decide how you're going to handle the myths and the uncertainties they present. Um, and of course, more broadly, when you're writing about scientific subjects, you have to um, address the big challenge of translating the science. Uh, you have to get, you know, make it clear and concise and accurate and compelling. Um, and then there's also the ch challenge of dealing with the gaps in the historical record, fragmentary facts or unreliable sources giving interviews. Um, and then to some extent, it's the question of how much you're going to um, embrace these uncertainties and reveal them for the reader, um, sort of transparently show the uncertainties and, and um, analyze them, or do you do your best to triangulate the information and give wh what comes across at least as a solid and authoritative um, account? Um, and for instance, with Oppenheimer, there's this incident of the poison apple uh, which occurred during his days as a student at Cambridge in 1925-26. And this story has, has morphed through various forms in, in different tellings. And it was actually Peter Goddard who brought this incident to my attention. He's a theoretical physicist and a former uh, director of the Institute uh, nearly 40 years after Oppenheimer. And he's gathered a fact file on the poison apple incident. And he's tried to chase down the various facts versus the fiction um, through some of the numerous Oppenheimer biographies over the years. And the basic facts of it seem to be that Oppenheimer and a few friends were away on vacation in Corsica, so away from Cambridge. And Oppenheimer suddenly said at one point that he had to get back immediately um, because he had left a poison apple on the desk of his tutor, Patrick Blackett. Um, and he had to get back to mitigate the situation in some way. So then the question is, uh, does one interpret the poison apple literally? Did Oppenheimer literally try to poison and murder his tutor? Or was Oppenheimer speaking figuratively or metaphorically, which apparently would have been in keeping with his character? Um, so did the, the notion of the poison apple suggest that maybe he left a paper on Blackett's desk and he realized suddenly that there was an error that he had to go back and fix or explain? Um, and so in Goddard's file, uh, at least, the first published account of this is 1969, which is two years after Oppenheimer's death. And um, that gives the latter interpretation of that Oppenheimer was speaking metaphorically. Um, but then in later accounts, the possibility of a more literal interpretation is raised. Um, and the story gets distorted uh, depending on which source you follow. There there's, seems to be three main interviews two friends of Oppenheimer's who were there with him on the vacation and they expressed some doubt that he was speaking literally um, and they think he might have been hallucinating. Uh, 
But the third source who who wasn't there, but he got it from Oppenheimer, and he thinks it's it's really true. And he seems to be the source of some embellishments or maybe conflating two different incidents and dates getting mix, mixed up. Did it happen in the in the fall or the spring? Um, so in some of the later biographies, uh, you can see the authors grappling on the page to varying degrees with the uncertainty, um, whether it's literal or metaphorical uh, in the interpretation, whether it should be. And, um, but in other accounts, in sort of the later accounts, it's, you know, the uncertainty seems to be edited out entirely. Yeah. Uh, and it's in favor of the literal interpretation that he really did leave a toxic apple on Blackett's desk. So it's just interesting to see that, you know, the myth is too, too good to resist. And, you know, it's a fine balance. It's always a question of um, what impression you want to leave on the reader and how much you want to reveal of the sort of the machinations of how you're figuring it out as a writer. Just comment briefly on, uh, on, on that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I can't add anything to your <laughs> expert uh, uh, description of that. Just to say that I spoke to uh, Blackett's wife about uh, about this, uh, and uh, she uh, said that she never heard uh, Patrick Blackett men say anything about this. He was quite an austere character, as as most people know, he was an absolutely superb experimenter. Um, uh, but he she, he never uh, made any comment about this. Uh, but he, but she pointed out, I thought, uh, very tellingly, that uh, he, he was not particularly well disposed to Oppenheimer. He actually actively tries to stop people joining the Manhattan Project, for example. Right? So everything is loaded. I mean, uh, it, she, she couldn't be sure that it did or didn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, apparently they oh, had one, one thing you didn't mention, Siobhan, was that when I first read about that story, it, it, it was used as a, a, a crutch, so to speak, to support the idea that, uh, that Oppenheimer was uh, uh, resentful of Blackett's virtuosity as an experimenter. Uh, Oppenheimer, like many good theories, all fingers and thumbs as, a, as an experimenter. Blackett was an absolute master of uh, uh, you know, what, you know, one of the two greatest theorists, work, uh, experimenters working under uh, uh, under um, uh, Rutherford. Uh, but I suspect we will never actually know, as you're saying there, but we should be much more careful I'm probably one of them uh, in presenting the, the account of that. Well, Goddard is still trying to to track yeah, down, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, he may have more information to go on. But it's you know, it's it's um, it's a minor minor myth in the Oppenheimer uh, legacy, but sort of speaks to you know, you you're you're trying to get something out of the myth that is revealing of the character of the person, and so you're doing this dissection of it, and and mm -hmm. may not share that with your reader. I'll, I'll just piggyback on that and say that this is, to me, one of the really tricky things about Oppenheimer in particular is, and of course, it's like this with any subject, that he is full of these strange stories, these these things where there's rumors and, and it's not clear what happened. And that particular part of his life, when he's in in England, right, and during graduate school and all that is is not a good one for him. It, I mean, it's something he identified later as this sort of turning point. He kind of comes around and the character of Oppie sort of emerges shortly afterwards um, when he goes to the Netherlands and he sort of leave, he leaves the United States this kind of not sure what he's doing and he comes back the reigning king. And that's a really interesting moment. And I think it's relevant to this Nolan picture because like my reading of that and of course I can't get into Oppenheimer's head more than anybody else can but Oppenheimer feels to me like somebody playing a role like historically like he became the Oppie character the hat is his little outfit that he puts on and all that and so we're watching Cillian Murphy like playing a role of a man playing a role right like there's some complicated thing going on there and of course that gives Murphy a lot of um, leeway like he can interpret he, he should feel free to interpret but we should always remember that not only is that not the the real character the real character is not the real character like we're all playing like roles upon roles upon roles with Oppenheimer it feels very I think obvious because he does like very self-consciously reinvent himself and this is also when he starts getting into Hindu mysticism and he starts getting into Marxism like all these things happen at this very like 
it's like his 20s, right? Like it happens to everybody. But like, it's this very crucial moment in his life that he becomes the Oppie character that we like to write about. And so to me, that's a really interesting thing to play with uh, as a watcher of the fiction to see what they're going to do because they have a lot of different types of possible source material they could play on. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I'll just take us back to, from what you said, back to history in general that i mean as historians there's a, there's only one rule you cannot change the facts mm -hmm. but the other rule is that you can choose the facts you can you know <laughs> among all the facts you can choose the facts you want to to tell your story and that's that's what we do as storytellers and and to me as the you know i just sort of came to the field of history by by accident but you also the most exciting thing is to discover the facts and you start with books that's sort of the the entry level thing and then then you discover archives where where caitlin and emma you know the the mathematics library effectively is an archive and, and you so you can find things in the archives and then the really exciting thing is to go out in the wild and find discover facts that are out there and you know the unknown species that are out in the wild and that's where you know someone someday will find the truth about that in incident and you can never predict when it will it will turn up in a trunk in in a london auction or something <laughs> um actually that that's a really great segue to our our fourth question which is uh, moving us a little bit from the Oppie, from the Oppie era the oppenheimer era to the era of today um how much do you think scientific scientific labor and especially the public's understanding of scientific labor has changed since the age of Oppenheimer um especially especially relevant question given the the pandemic that we've all just been through uh I think uh Graham let's start with you on that boy that's a uh, yes I'm <laughs> it's that is such a huge question um <laughs> I, I, in order to make it attractable, can I just uh, 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 try to concentrate on on big science, so to speak, of which the, uh, the Manhattan Project is is uh, is one example. As I said earlier, I mean th that is the prime example of a of of a, of a massive mobil uh, mobilization of a group of scientists. We saw it most recently, as you said there, like you alluded to, in uh, in um, uh, in the. the uh, manufacture of drugs to combat COVID. Um, it, 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 I, I, I think though that uh, with the Manhattan Project in particular, we pick Oppenheimer as the as, as the grand figure, right? This is why, of course, he's the star of the movie, and why we're talking about about him today. But it, in fact, it's it's so much more complex than that. Uh, um, and what I'll be interested to see in this is, in this movie is what what angles that the director chooses to uh, uh, to present uh, 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 to present that project in, um, because Oppenheimer I think is, is is such a complicated character that it's um, uh, that the. the if, 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 if I could see a situation where that could obscure the nature of the project itself. Oh. Well, Alex, George, and Siobhan, uh, jump in. I'll, I'll totally jump in. I mean, I, I love thinking about what is the what is the age of Oppenheimer mean? Because in his life, you have sort of two distinct ages. You have the sort of pre-World War II and the post-World War II, right? And mm -hmm. science, when Oppenheimer was learning it, like the, quantum physics, when Oppenheimer was learning it, was done in a small seminar room with a very small number of people. Mm -hmm. And Oppenheimer himself was reportedly a terrible teacher. I mean, people loved him, but like he just chain smoked and wrote on the board and rewrote over his equations. And there's these cases of people taking his class three or four times and saying, oh, it's a really great class. I still don't understand it at all, but like, it's really great. And, and like, that's a very different thing than what happens like post Sputnik, 
where quantum physics classes can fill a whole auditorium at MIT and, uh, uh, you know, to bring, to bring Freeman Dyson back into it again, Feynman diagrams in part catch on because they're really good at teaching large numbers of people how to do this stuff and they're not meandering philosophical conversations in the way that the pre-World uh, uh, War II uh, quantum physics often was. So like even in his lifetime, there's two different ages. And if we think of like, his life from 45 to the end of the 60s that's a particularly potent moment in american science you know that's real cold war science in the 70s right after not long after oppenheimer dies you start to see things start to kind of go off the rails a little bit for a lot of reasons and certainly after the end of the cold war the funding models start to really change and things and one question i like to ask my students is like what if you believe, which I think most historians of science do, I think scientists would argue about this, but like that the content of what science is done is in some way related to the context that does the science, even in the simplest sense of what questions get asked, who funds them, where do the brightest students go when they want to do something interesting with their life, right? Like that, it, it, that's a very broad context, but like it, it shapes what majors people are and who's out there right and, and who gets grants and who doesn't like what's our context going to produce going forward right what kind of science or technology are we prioritizing to me that's a really interesting question I teach at a stem school to ask people who are going out there like what do you think is we what what would our world produce what would our what should it produce um and I think that's a really like deep question to ask about these things it's something that Oppenheimer himself very much cared about right because this is one of the reasons he does all this public outreach we mentioned the right lectures part of it is he doesn't want to be a passive member of the culture he is trying to influence that direction in a really pretty strong way so I think that's a really interesting way to sort of think about the age of Oppenheimer and beyond and you know what that might tell us can I just add one one brief thing? Because I just I want to make sure make sure we don't uh, uh, miss something here, which I I think is important. I know it's only one way of looking at it, but uh, we we, were, we we talked earlier about uh, Oppenheimer being in Cambridge and then in Göttingen, which is one of the crucibles of, uh, of 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 quantum quantum physics. First of all, important thing: the early in the twentieth century, the two foundational theories of fundamental physics, both in Europe. Right, they were uh, quantum quantum physics, mainly European uh, relativity, uh, Einstein and, and others again in in Europe. By the time you get to the nineteen thirties, when Oppenheimer is in his pomp uh, in in Berkeley, right, America is the world scientific leader, and he is one of the pre uh, preeminent people, right, as and, uh, a, a great leader, a great uh, a, a great critic who set up at the first really good theoretical physics department here uh, in America. What I want to stress is on en route to that, uh, uh, this is a slightly harsh, but it's, it's to be provocative, but by the standards of the people um, that Oppenheimer revered, and he cultivated what he called a taste for physics in Europe, I'm talking here about your Paulis, your Bohrs, your Dirac's, your Heisenberg's, Oppenheimer was a failure. Right. He was absolutely not of the front, very front rank of theoretical physics. And this is not to deny he was a very talented uh, theoretical physicist. That's not in doubt. He was undoubtedly respected. But people, to use Pauli's phrase, thought that, it, that, he, uh, that he regarded physics as an avocation, right? a hobby, as opposed, uh, they, they said, to psychoanalysis, which was his real interest. Now, if if he feels if he feels that somehow an imposter, so to speak, at the very front, right, then the the leadership of the Manhattan Project, which was offered to him, I don't know the exact circumstances, that gave him a chance to to really uh, accept which he took, right. But I just wonder. I don't know this because there's psychoanalysis in there. One could speculate all day. But the extent to which Oppenheimer was driven by that opportunity uh, to 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 make to make put himself in the front rank of history. Siobhan and George? I'm feeling George might have something interesting to say. <laughs> go ahead, I'll follow. No, no, you go. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, quickly, yes, Graham, you're exactly right. And, and these big things that change the world are often driven by very personal things. And I think, I think in Oppenheimer's case, 
you know, it was almost was his chance to lead an army. And he he had always felt in the shadow, it was, it was complicated personal stuff, but the, of the, you know, the people who had gone out and, and fought in the Spanish Civil War, that sort of thing. And this was his chance that now to, in the broad historical sense, we've touched on this, but the the real lingering question from the Oppenheimer time that still is is not a mystery, but to, we all know that, I mean, there was the Manhattan Project and there was the Apollo Project. And both those projects, there is no way we could accomplish that in the same time period today. Because we, have, yeah. we have so much better resources and nobody would dream of doing that in three years or, or getting to the moon within a decade you know we're we'll be lucky to get there a decade from now um and that's you know how did this how did this happen and, and oppenheimer is sort of part of that central mystery how he as the orchestra conductor got that to to work and why can't we do it today This maybe is a legacy question, but I just want to jump onto it because now George has said this and, and Graham had something kind of similar, which is sort of saying like, my God, what if we could be a Manhattan Project again? What if we could do it? And the one thing I'll always, I always push back on in this is to point out that like, how did they do it back then? They had no oversight. They had very low safety standards. <laughs> they, nobody, it was one general and a couple of his handpicked people running a self autonomy with the, uh, on a black budget from the president. Congress didn't know about it. There was very little paperwork. Um, like people died and they just sort of swept it under the rug. They killed a hundred thousand people without asking anybody right like i mean i'm just like pointing out like i always push back on the like do we want another manhattan project thing because i'm like, i don't know like maybe that's not the way like if we're still arguing 80 years later over whether the manhattan project was a good idea or not like that might not be the legacy we want for whatever future manhattan projects we have right like sure. and so i'm not saying we couldn't like i'm not saying that like yeah i agree it'd be really nice if we fix climate change but like on the other hand, I find the Manhattan Project such a tricky, as somebody who works on secrecy and things like that, it's a tricky thing to hold up as like, yes, this is how you do it. Because mm -hmm. it's not a scientist day camp, right? It's a military industrial project to make a weapon of mass destruction and deploy it against the country that didn't have any weapons of mass destruction. And I'm not saying whether that was right or wrong, but I am saying it's a little and and literally doing it with no oversight at all and it's it's, it's as anti-democratic as you can be it, it does feel sometimes a little bit like admiring how well like Mussolini's trains run right like being like well I don't know there's a downside to that right but anyway this is my little pushback as a historian <laughs> I still think there's a, a point there I, Alex Beck of course is perfectly correct but I still think there's a point of whether whether we have the willpower to get together in that way. I mean, I, I'm personally mm -hmm. rather distressed by this, the way now that we're moving away from such cooperative ventures. But that's that's what interests me. It's not, uh, not the particular details of the Manhattan Project, but this astonishing um, uh, coming together of that talent and the way it was marshaled so well by the person we're talking about. And of course, others with government support, as Alex said. Oh. Ah, uh, Caitlin, you think it's a good? I think it's a good time to open open things up to the Q and A. Uh, we've gotten a bunch in the last forty five minutes. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, Caitlin, you want to pick one out? Um, actually, if we want to give our speakers just one opportunity to, to think about a grand takeaway about Oppenheimer's legacy, uh, maybe we can go uh, for our last moderated question, go very quickly and have each of our speakers kind of say their big takeaway that they'd like folks to think about, about the relevancy, um, of Oppenheimer as we go into the future. Well, I'll start with, um, just something I gleaned from the, the lecture, uh, that I listened to and which, which struck me and that was Oppenheimer was talking about some science as pleasure and instruction and power. Um, power for advancement and betterment. He said, you know, acknowledge that betterment was a tricky idea, um, but then also said that the power to change is not always necessarily good. So it's not always necessary to follow that path, uh, which seems sort of together with the, um, you know, 
the importance of everyone sort of being engaged in this critical thinking of why and how and to what end um, seems like timeless advice for us. Uh, George, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I, I'll give the last word to Oppenheimer himself, uh, which, so this is from Clary von Neumann's unpublished journals, which, which thanks to Marina von Neumann turned up in a, you know, filing cabinet next to the water heater. And now, <laughs> partly thanks to the Shelby White archives there in the Library of Congress with the rest of von Neumann's papers. But so this is right after the, security hearings and Oppenheimer has been stripped of his clearance and von Neumann decides to join the Atomic Energy Commission, which people disapprove of. So Clary is explaining how they they go to, to talk to the people in Princeton. So she says, Veblen strongly disapproved of Johnny's decision to go to the Atomic Energy Commission and told him so in no uncertain words. Veblen being the person who brought von Neumann to Princeton. We also went to call on the Oppenheimers and that was anything but a relaxed visit. I shall always remember Robert summing up his attitude in a very simple statement. There have to be good people on both sides. So there, that's my takeaway. I'll, I'll just throw out that to me, when I think about what when I tell the story of Oppenheimer, when I teach him, what's the parable he's, I, I try to make this very explicit, like what does he serve aside from being interesting? But to me, it's it's about responsibility, like how much responsibility it's about, uh, like, you know, how much do we, responsibility does he have? What does he do? The Should the scientist just be taking orders? He was not just taking orders. He was very involved in a lot of these things. How does that change things? He has this famous quote that the physicists have known sin and it is a lesson they can never forget. And I think that's an interesting thing to contemplate. When I talk to young students today, they tend not to think that they have responsibility for what they build if they work for the government or a corporation or something. And I think that's interesting that they just don't seem to... They, they, their justification is somebody else would have done it even if I didn't do it. So there's no change in the outcome. So I'm not morally culpable, which is really bad ethics, but it's very interesting that that's sort of part of what like the culture has gotten into them, I think. And I just want to throw out one response to Oppenheimer's quote. This is again, von Neumann, since we're bringing him up a bunch and he's on the picture of the slide, but he said when, you know, in response to Oppenheimer's quote about the physicist knowing sin is he said, uh, sometimes one confesses a sin in order to take credit for it. And I think that's an interesting aspect of Oppenheimer, and I'll be interested to see whether any of that comes out in the movie, but he is sort of self-consciously setting himself up to be the interesting, important person, partially for the imposter syndrome that I think Graham correctly identifies, but, but also because like he has goals, he has aims, and for him to be the figurehead means that he can maybe get his aims. He has very big post-war aims, separate from World War II. He thinks he's going to save the world, and maybe he will, maybe he won't, but like that's an aspect I think when you only focus on the World War II stuff, you miss that a lot of his career is what happens afterwards. And that's, of course, what he gets sort of punished for in a way with the security hearing. Yeah, could I uh, come from uh, left field slightly? I just uh, indulge in a little bit of virtual history for a minute. Not, I don't want to be disobliging to, to Oppenheimer, but I would suggest that if um, the Second World War uh, just hadn't taken place, or there had been, uh, or nuclear energy had not um, been revealed when it was just before the war. You got the great, uh, you know, the, uh, this astonishing co co coincidence. Then I think uh, the Oppenheimer would be largely forgotten. Uh, he would be seen as a very good physicist who became probably the president of a university and be an, e an excellent fundraiser, an excellent person at ceremonies and what have you. But he became a, gr uh, a great figure. Um, well, I should say, sorry, I ought to say one more thing about wh why uh, he, he, what prevented him from being an excellent physicist. That was his focus, something that so many of his peers talked about, right, that he was always jumping from one thing to another. And his greatest work, when he, uh, when, when he was talking about the collapse of stars, it was a really first class piece of work on which the theory of black holes is now, is now based. It was developed uh, later, but he didn't go back to that, wasn't even interested in it uh, later in his life. 
with the Manhattan Project, it gave him the opportunity, it, the drive to focus. He had the skills as a, as a physicist, the intellect, the pe people skills, um, and the ability to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, liaise with the government that I'd struggle to find somebody who would be a, a, another choice for that role. And he seized it brilliantly. And that's why we're talking about him today. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, since we have about seven minutes left, we are going to go over to our questions from our question and answer. Um, I'm just going to start us off in order. Our first one is kind of a fun question. Have any of our panelists seen John Adams' opera, Dr. Atomic? I, I watched some of the DVD version of it, and uh, it was a little hard for me to get into, I have to admit, having General Grove singing his lines and singing the Los, they were singing the Los Alamos Primer at one point. And, you know, it's interesting idea. I I, I, I think it's interesting to him. I, I think opera is one of the weirder art forms we have. And I think trying to reimagine how you do a story like this in that is a useful exercise, though I have to admit, I, I was not, I had a hard time getting into it. <laughs> I think that's a groundbreaking uh, relationship between opera and science. Hopefully we'll continue <laughs> to test well, out. There was a successful play a few years ago by the mm -hmm. Royal Shakespeare Company, and I think it's by a playwright called um, um, I, I, uh, Morton White. I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. I do apologize. Good play, and it transferred to the West End. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, this, it, 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 Oppenheimer is a, is a theme that's going to keep on giving, I think. <laughs> uh, I believe one of you mentioned to us in planning this event that uh, Oppenheimer went to see himself portrayed in a play before he had even died and was okay. not very pleased with it. That's the, the, the Kip Hart play. He hated the Kip Hart play. He, and, I, and, and this is not, it doesn't matter what Oppenheimer would have thought about this movie, by the way. I just want to put that out there because yeah. we know he would have hated it. It doesn't yeah, matter yeah. what it was, he would have hated it. Yeah, but it he hated the idea that he was being mythologized and he hated the idea that he was standing in as this character with regrets and whatever he thought, he didn't like the idea of some playwright writing his, his mm. story, but like, who cares? Who cares what Oppenheimer I know, no, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a great point. Thank you, guys. Uh, Emma, do you want to answer the, or ask the next question? Ah, uh, yeah. So I'm going to, we have about four minutes left. So I'm going to sum it up. Um, how do we overcome the loss of uh, belief and confidence in, uh, in science? Um, and was there, was there, um, problems with public confidence and belief uh, back in the age of Oppenheimer that we should think about? It's a dark question. Oh. <laughs> I think the more scientists we have writing about their work, um, you know, in, in ways that the average person can understand, it's it's can be a tall order. Um, but that's certainly crucial. And, 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 encouraging everybody to sort of engage in, in that method of thinking of, you know, uh, independent thinking, critical thinking, asking those questions. I think Oppenheimer would have been the wrong person to ask this. Oh. And, and I don't mean this. And I, and I, I'm not sure we're the right people to ask this either, but like, like, he is a an expert's expert, right? That's his, he, he exists and thrives in a world of expertise and, and super erudition and education and all of that. And that is not the problem we're talking about. The problem is not highly educated people having the wrong ideas. The problem is people who are not educated and don't want to be educated and resent education. And that's almost a psychological question or a sociolo sociological one. And I will just say, if I was going to, again, tie it into Oppenheimer, one of the real disasters that came out of Oppenheimer's sort of legacy was this idea that a theoretical physicist can tell you everything about life. And that is totally wrong. And like he himself is a great example of like theoretical physicist knows a lot about many things. Politics is not one of them, right? And I'm not saying that you can't know about these things, but there are other forms of expertise in the world. And like, for me, the question of how do you convince people not to drink Drano is a really, is not a question that a theoretical <laughs> physicist is going to give a good answer to because they are not the target audience. And they don't even, they don't know who the target audience even is. They probably haven't met anybody in that audience for 30 years. Right. And, and, and so anyway, just putting that out there. 
Uh, I think we have like a couple minutes left. Um, do we want to have like one really short question? Uh, Caitlin? We can ask. Um, so we have a question that I think we've explored a little bit, but this is a great opportunity to kind of have a last word on this. Um, one of our participants, Douglas Bell, says he's intrigued by the parallel drawn between AI and the Manhattan Project. Um, and he asks, uh, is the gold rush towards AI subject to a similar critique? So are we rushing um, too fast towards AI? Is AI perhaps malign? Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're starting to have similar conversations around regulation and, um, you know, perhaps a little belatedly, but better late than never. Um, I can give you my short answer, which is just personally, I, I have no fear of bad AI, but I'm terrified of good AI. So you can oh. that out. But the, the domesticated, this AI will be good for you, absolutely terrifies me. The the classic Terminator bad AI, I have no fear of at all. <laughs> Maybe I'll give just one second to see if any of our other panelists want to give a last word on AI. I'll, I'll just say one thing, and this will tie it back to Oppenheimer again. Like, and, and there was another question I saw in the Atchison Lilienthal plan. And like one of Oppenheimer's major pushes after World War II is to try to end nuclear arms races and essentially disarm the world. And he came up with a pretty plausible way to do it with the UN, which is not too dissimilar to how the non-proliferation treaty works, right? And the interesting thing about Oppenheimer's contribution to this is pointing out essentially that nuclear weapons are not technically hard to regulate, right? If you can control all the uranium in the world and make sure nobody builds a, a, a factory the size of Oak Ridge, then like nobody has nuclear weapons, right? Like that's relatively, it, it's hard enough to make the weapons and there's such a material component that you could actually imagine outlawing them. And the difficulty of course is the politics of it, right? And they couldn't get that worked out and he was very disappointed about that. That's his great regret. Now, mm -hmm. Nuclear weapons in that framework are probably the easiest technology you could imagine regulating in many ways. They are so hard to make. They're not impossible, but they're so resource intensive. And it's so obvious if you're making them that in theory, they should have been the easy case. And we've done such a terrible job of that, that it should give us a lot of pause in imagining how we're going to regulate software. May I just uh, uh, close, if I may? Uh, with, with a, a quote I found in the, in the last week uh, from Oppenheimer just before he died, and it, it addresses something that I, I don't think we've actually talked about, which of course is the the, um, uh, the 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 trials that led to the withholding of his security clearance, which of course are great trauma for him, right? Um, and I, understandably, we we, we haven't uh, we can't cover everything. Um, what, what astonished me about this uh, this letter was written just a few weeks before he he died. It was written to James Chadwick, the discoverer of the neutron, and he it was it's it's a valedictory tone to the last paragraph. And he says, "Didn't we live at a, a lucky time when even our critics were so full of love and light?" Oh wow! Thank you, Graham, for sharing that. What a wonderful place for us to to pause here on this critical discussion. And um, I would I would also like to say uh, on on the AI discussion that I recommend that everyone uh, go look at the work of Institute faculty member Alondra Nelson, who is working on this very topic right now. Yeah, thank you. Emma. We definitely are very lucky at the Institute to be at the center of so many of these really fascinating questions about science, history and our future, really. Um, we want to thank everyone so much for the discussion, our panelists. I think we covered so many interesting topics from the difference between technology and science to myth and man. Uh, thank you so much. And just as a final note, this conversation is recorded and it will be made available in the near future on the Institute's website. And if you didn't get enough Oppenheimer content today and you're in the Princeton area, we just take a moment to mention that our friends at the Historical Society of Princeton are welcoming the general public to an Oppenheimer walking tour that's set to take place on July 28th, August 6th, and August 13th, and that will aim to uncover the role of Princeton and Oppenheimer's life. So if you have the opportunity, please feel free to join them. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful day.